Jenny's got more month than she's got money Works three jobs, she's barely getting by Bob got word his mom's been told it's cancer So many questions and all of them ask why Living in a broken world And a broken world won't give you any answers Everything is upside down Wrong is right and right is wrong But not for long No, not for long This broken world is cradled by the Savior Nothing here can take him by surprise Someday all this hurting will be over When every tear's been wiped away and dried But for now, we're living in a broken world But not for long no, not for long Mama spends her waking hours praying Her child's done wrong, left everything behind Daddy's getting tired, his faith is fading You can't give water from a well that's running dry We're living in a broken world And a broken world won't give you any answers Everything is upside down Wrong is right and right is wrong But not for long No, not for long This broken world Nothing here can take him by surprise And someday all this hurting will be over When every tear's been wiped away and dried But for now, we're living in a broken world But not for long Nothing here can take him by surprise and Someday all this hurting will be over Every tear's been wiped away and dry But for now, we're living in a broken world But not for long Broken world, but not for long. No, not for long.
back a little bit. I do have a Christmas song this morning. It's a new song that um, that I've uh, been writing. I've recently kind of got back into into writing a little bit more. So um, I hope you guys like this song. No trumpets played in the streets To announce the birth of a king A silent night was the only melody The angels sang of great joy To a nearby field of shepherd boys and they left to find the newborn prince of peace there was no castle with a golden throne just a stable miles away from home a wooden cradle held his majesty mary kissed his fingers and his toes she wrapped him up in swaddling clothes rags became a rope for royalty the tiny manger where jesus laid his head became a king-sized bed no tiny crowns or priceless jewels just humble hearts with nothing to lose they were poor but still the richest ones around they gathered up the softest hay and spread it out where the baby would lay then a feeding trough became holy ground there was no castle with a golden throne just a stable miles away from home a wooden cradle held his majesty mary kissed his fingers and his toes she wrapped him up in swaddling clothes and rags became a rope for royalty the tiny manger where jesus laid his head became a king-sized bed emmanuel the king of kings the savior who delivered me came so the lost could be found with a golden throne just a stable miles away from home a wooden cradle held his majesty mary kissed his fingers and his toes she wrapped him up in swaddling clothes and rags became a rope for royalty the tiny manger where jesus laid his head became a king-size bed. Good job. I want your words back. I want you to steal them. Oh, yeah. I'm sure I, I'm sure I could sing that like you did. Yeah. Okay, anyone else have a song, testimony, anything upon your heart? I feel like I've asked everybody. Nobody has anything. Who? No, he didn't have one either, so. Yeah. All right, Brother David, it's up to you, brother. Well, I do want to also uh, 
acknowledge all those. I appreciate the workers, too, in our Christmas dinner last Sunday evening, those who helped out in the kitchen and so forth. It seems like many hands make light work, and you all flowed together, and everyone contributed and brought in and helped make that dinner, and I think it was a blessed, uh, blessed afternoon, and I appreciate Tiffany and them and all the young people with the, the play, and just each and every one of you, and all come together, and that's what it takes, working together, and I thought it was one of the, uh, uh, for me, the one of the better dinners we've had in a long time. I believe there's close to 100 people, uh, 100 people in attendance, and it was really good, good food, good fellowship, and so forth. Uh, so if you have your Bibles this morning, I just want to give you that much, uh, thank you and appreciation for each and every one of you who shared and make that possible. <clears throat> I've noticed over giving and things, and I I see some of the, sometimes, uh, well, some givers are just uh, people, how they give, they go above and beyond sometimes. And God loves a cheerful giver. That's scripture. He doesn't love someone who grudgingly, it's out of the right motive, out of the right heart. And they give, and God will bless you in return for that, if not here in this life, in the life that which is to come. And whether you do give a cup of cold water and in the name of the Lord, you'll no wise lose your reward if it's done rightfully with the right motive and so forth, the Lord will bless you and reward you. First Peter, going back to First Peter chapter 1, I'm still contending with some things, and uh, I was trying to uh, work through this like many of you as well, but still dealing with some uh, drainage and so forth, but I'm doing a lot better than it was. So First Peter chapter 1, we'll begin reading verse 5 who are kept by the power of God through faith and the salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptation, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold, that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found on the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen, you love, and whom though now you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Now this is, uh, the Lord is using Simon Peter, and Peter's trying to write here to other believers under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to encourage him in times of persecution and trials and how the certain things that they are to maintain. And uh, here in the Word of God, he mentions at least three different things and already I've preached upon. He gives you the lively hope and then enduring faith, the faith that you have in the Lord and then uh, also the love, the love that you have for Jesus. And those are mentioned again in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 13, it's called the love chapter, but it is, it is the greatest of these. He says, out of all the gifts is, of course, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of all those is love. Uh, but there's three things in the midst of trial that you want to maintain, and uh, those are hope and faith and love. Now we're going to take a look this morning at enduring, enduring faith, a faith that endures unto the end. Uh, that's what Matthew, in Matthew 24, verse 13, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he's on the Mount of Olives, Matthew 24 deals with prophecy about the end times and about certain things that come up on this earth that is to trial, try it and try others as well, believers, and the various things we experience as we move in the end times. In Matthew 24, verse 13, the Lord Jesus himself said, but he said, they, he said that sure endure, the same shall be saved. They that endure until the end, the same shall be saved. And uh, he's talking about <clears throat> even in spite, it's having a faith in spite of your circumstances or what you're going through uh, or your consequences, but you hold fast to your faith and you continue to trust in the Lord. And here in the Word of God, that's what Peter, even in the midst of trials, 
Even like Job had said when he said Job uh, went through much adversity within his life and he came up with these words and he said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And when we put our total trust in the Lord and we trust him in times of adversity and difficulties within our life, God will see you through it. A faith that cannot, I've said this before and many others have, a faith that cannot be tested, cannot be trusted, and God will test and allow, allow trials to come within mine and your life to see whether or not we truly have the faith and we keep the faith. That's very important. But notice here, and again with Peter, and I read back with verse 5, we're kept by the power of God through faith. Notice that you're through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. You do the committing, and God will do the keeping. Amen. You commit yourself unto the Lord Jesus Christ. You give him your soul. Paul said in another scripture, he said, He is able to keep that which I have committed unto him. What's he talking about? He's talking about his soul. Well, he's a savior. And the Lord Jesus Christ, he is able to keep that which I have committed. You commit yourself. You commit your soul and trust in him. And he is able to keep that. But you've got to do the committing. He'll do the keeping and the keeping power of God. I started out several years ago, 20-some years with the Lord. I haven't been perfect. I've been through obstacles and difficulties within my life. But the Lord, I'd love to say David kept himself. But that'd be wrong. It is the, the, the keeping power of God, the grace of God, the Holy Spirit. If I sinned, and yes, David has sinned after he's been saved, and I've had to ask the Lord to forgive me, and you know what? You, if you're honest as well, you sinned probably too after you've been saved. Didn't say I ran out into the world. Didn't say I committed some habitual sin out here. I didn't say that, but I'm just saying if you step out of line and you sin, I've had to ask the Lord to forgive me. But the Lord has always been good. The Holy Spirit of God, when you've been born again, that new nature on the inside of you, and that's one of the marks of being a child of God, that there's something you just can't take pleasure in what you used to take pleasure in. And the Holy Spirit will check you and he will convict you. And he will tell you that is wrong. You need to repent of that. And so you turn to the Lord and say, Lord, would you forgive me? And you confess that sin and you forsake that sin. Forsake that sin. And he'll forgive you. Amen. Through the blood of Jesus. And he is faithful to do that over. He's done it over and over. Now, we don't want to use that excuse. And sometimes, sometimes we as human beings, we get in. Everybody's doing and everybody does it and everything. Now, God doesn't want us to roll in it and sin and continue in sin. That's not what the Bible teaches, being a child of God. But somewhere you're different. But the Lord has helped keep, have kept, has helped keep me down through the years, and he will keep you as well. But even in the midst of the trial, no one likes really trials. But after this, he says, we're in. He said, you revealed in the last time, verse 6, wherein you greatly rejoice through now for a season. If now you be in heaviness through manifold temptation. Uh, temptations is not temptation by the devil to sin. The word temptations means trials. And manifold means a variety. It, it's a, a variety of trials within your life or circumstances that you're going through. And uh, he is telling us here in the word of God that you should rejoice. Now, that's not natural, is it? Notice the response to a Christian. When trouble or trials come your way, it is almost as if he's saying, here's what you are to do. You are to still rejoice. Now, Peter's talking through dealing with persecution. Sometimes we suffer as being a child of God. When you live right for the Lord, you're going to suffer persecution. And blessed, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, he said, blessed are they that persecuted for righteousness sake, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Well, if people want to call you a, a Jesus freak or a Jesus lover or so forth and you're standing on the word of God and the promises of God and living right and you have opposition around you because of the way that you live, well, you are to say praise the Lord. Amen. You are to certain rejoicing. But you suffer sometimes because of persecution. We suffer because of things down here in this world down here. We live in a sin and fallen world. 
and people do things to us, and we do things to them, and so forth in this world in which we live. We live with heartache and pain all around us. But he said, here when trials come, how, why should you have a response like, why should I be happy when I hear negative news? Because your attitude, it's all in your attitude. Your outlook in life, sometimes if you have a good outlook, it determines your outcome. And so Peter says, when it comes to you, you've got to know something. If your faith is strong in the Lord and it is steadfast, that Romans 8, 28, all things are working together for the good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose, even though God has allowed this to come within your life, God's still working something for the good. Now, it's hard to rejoice. Now listen, it's not natural to rejoice. I don't like trouble. My flesh, in my natural flesh, no one likes trouble. In fact, most of us steer from it, right? We want to try to avoid it as best as we can. But sometimes we have to deal with it. But you, sometimes in life, it's not natural to rejoice. Well, that's where the work of the Holy Spirit, it's not natural, it's supernatural. Because when you place your faith in the Lord Jesus, and then you're depending upon the grace of God and the mercies of God and you're trusting in the Lord and the Holy Spirit, he will infuse and fill you with his presence and you say, look at that person over there. They can have a smile and yet they're going through this within their life. How can they have such joy? Because your joy doesn't come through your circumstances. It comes from the presence of the Lord. Nehemiah 8.10 says the joy of the Lord is your strength. When you're walking in the Spirit of God and walking in the will of God for your life and trusting Him, it is supernatural. The presence of God will infuse unto you and give you power and put a smile upon your face. And the world will see something that others did not see. In James chapter 1, he says, Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation, diverse trials within your life. Count it all joy if you experience some things. Count it all joy. Well, we want to get rid of you. <clears throat> we don't want you on this job because you're too honest. We don't like you because you, you, you're, too, you're too righteous. You're too this. We need somebody to fuzz the paperwork or to fudge the paperwork and uh, cheat a little bit or do this or that. But God's got the all saying, ah, but you're going to say, hey, if you don't need me here and you want to run a company like that, so be it. I don't need to be here. And God, when he closes one door, you know what he'll do? He'll open up another door for you and probably something even greater in turn for that. And you think sometimes, I have learned in life, whatever you go through, that there's something better on up ahead. It might be at that time it looks dark and it looks black, but God's got something better up ahead. Remember, weeping endures for a night and joy cometh in the morning. If you're going to go through, you've got to go through the night to get to the day, don't you? You've got to go through the storms of life to get the rainbows of life. You've got to have pressure put up on a piece of gold in order to get the diamond. So you don't expect something. You've got to bear a cross, child of God, in order to get a crown one day, don't you? Amen. Well, it's not, it's not natural. Most of us, when trouble comes, we get in flesh and we get down and, and it's like the air is let out of us. That's the way we are human. It's not supernatural. I don't know how you could be so positive. Peter says it's not in you. It's in the grace of God. It's in the power of God that you're trusting in the Lord even in spite of your difficulty and adversity because when you have a good outlook, it determines the outcome. A good attitude. You're a positive. You're feeding off positive energy. The devil wants you to feed off negativity. He wants you to get in despair. He wants you to be discouraged. He wants you to be down and out. But he said, wherein you greatly should rejoice through manifold temptations. Notice that reality here in heaviness through manifold temptation. Manifold. You know, it means a variety of trials but it means a colorful manifold. It's not something on a vehicle. That's not what the word means here. It means it's like a variety of colors. 
as all different colors. You ever heard someone say, I feel like I've been through this and I've been beat black and blue? Well, sometimes when you deal with red, you deal with emergency. And sometimes when you deal with the blue, you hear people say, I got the blues. I got a blue, blue Christmas. You know what they're saying? They're depressed. They're, they're down. They're discouraged. When you go through black, you go through, use black as sorrow. It's sadness. There's all kinds of various trials in your life. Doesn't matter if they're small or if they're great. And he said there's a manifold temptation. There's a variety or an array of them. And they can come your way in all different things. Sometimes it's not the big things. Sometimes it's the little things that trip people up more than any other thing. Smallest little things in life sometimes. But there's the reality. Everyone has troubles. Everyone has trials. And when we begin to look within ourselves, we think we're the only one going through it. But look around and you'll see somebody else, I assure you, far worse than what you are. You'll see somebody that can't get out of bed. You'll see somebody on a machine. You'll see somebody in pain and have to be given morphine and so forth to try to, to uh, reduce the pain level and all these things. Just look, you'll see some that are trapped in their own body who used to be able to talk and used to be able to walk and now they can only see through their eyes and see people coming and going and they can't talk and they can't walk anymore. You'll see somebody that's a lot farther worse off than you. <laughs> you say the Lord and that's what hope and sometimes the reality and he gives you the reasons here he's giving you the reason verse 7 that the reason for your trial that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth well your faith is precious precious that means it's valuable it's highly to be prized much more than that of gold it's tried in the fire but what's God allowing the trial for not only to build character and to build us up to make us strong, to purify our faith. It's to purify. Your faith is precious. Is it the really pure faith? As people go through trials, and you know not everybody endures. Not everybody, as soon as the trial comes, all of a sudden they're ready to give up and quit. They're ready to fall away. Many... People sometimes, as Christians, sometimes down here in this life, they think they have faith. And I told you before, I'll describe this in the book of James. And uh, James chapter 2, he, he wonderfully tells us exactly what a genuine, a saving faith is really all about. Some people say, I believe. I believe in God. Pastor, I know the Lord Jesus and I'm a believer. I believe in God. Well, believing in God is good, but that's not going to save you. You know, you have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why in John 14, verse 1, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. There's only one that can save you, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to believe what he did on Calvary through his death, burial, and resurrection. And people, a lot of people believe in something. And everybody, Romans chapter 12, everybody has been given by God a measure of faith. And even atheists, it's not that they can't believe, they won't believe. They refuse to believe that there is a God that which is in heaven. But people believe in all these false gods, idol gods, and all these other things around them. People believe in a lot of things, but that doesn't make them a believer in order to be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have to know him as your personal Lord and Savior. Now, uh, do you know what a dead faith? James said there's three kinds of faith, and he mentions in James chapter 2. There's either dead faith, it's a demonic faith, or it's a dynamic faith, and that's the true, genuine, saving faith of God. The first one is a dead faith. People say, I believe, but they don't work for the Lord. They don't live for God. It's an intellectual. It's all it is within their mind. They simply say, just believe. But there's no change in their life. They're not, they're not following the Lord Jesus. They're not a disciple of Christ. They say, can I be a secret disciple? Stay at home and so forth. But listen, faith without works, James said, is dead. What are you doing for the Lord? 
How are you serving? Well, I'm not doing a thing, but I don't believe you have to go to church, and I don't believe this, and I don't believe you have to do anything for the Lord. I just believe you can be stay at home and everything, and it's just between me and God, or I got church out here in creation, and I'll go out here in the woods and so forth, and yes, you can worship out in the woods, but that's not. When you are born again, a faith without works is dead. So people say, everything I believe, but do you really believe? Then a demonic faith is not only an intellectual who believes in their mind. A demonic faith is one who also has feelings. The, he said in James, he mentions that he said in James 2.19, the devils believe and they tremble. Well, you, do you know the demons, they believe? They believed when Jesus was here on earth, they knew exactly who Jesus was. Legion knew who Jesus was. Demons know who Jesus is. The devil knows who Jesus is. He knows the word of God. He was cast out of heaven. But he's not following Jesus. The demons know who he is, but it doesn't make him a follower. They believe in him. They have feeling. They tremble. The devils believe and they tremble. People say, I feel God. You can even have an intellectual in your head and you can have a feeling, a feel so good salvation. But you don't have a no-so salvation. But the genuine saving faith, a dynamic faith, is an intellectual. It involves the mind. It involves the emotion and it involves the will. And you surrender your will to the Lord Jesus Christ and say, Lord, you deny yourself and take up your cross and say, I'm going to follow you. And Jesus said, whosoever taketh not up his cross and followeth me is not my disciple. That is the Bible. That's a genuine saving faith that it's a faith that's going to start out with Jesus and you're going to go all the way with Jesus. Amen. And the Lord, it's not sometimes when tests come, and they do come, over and over in the Bible, the various tests, when we come through difficulties and circumstances in life, many people fall away because they did not have a genuine saving faith. Many of them started out because the motive was they wanted God as a quick fix. They had a feeling. They somehow, they just wanted to use him. They didn't want him as Savior. They want him to save their marriage or whatever it may be, and I'm not their judge. But people start out, you've seen many people. I've seen many people come to the altars, and you never see them no more. And they're going and they're coming. When you see a really, a truly person gets convert, gets converted, they're going to have fruit within their life and evidence, and there's a change in their life. When Jesus comes in, he's going to change you. There is a change been made. You're no longer the same. But sometime in Matthew 13, Jesus talked about the seven parables, seed and a sower, Remember the seed and the sower, and the seed was the word of God, and he sowed a seed. He, when he sowed the seed upon the various grounds, only 25% fell upon the good ground in a good heart. And they received that seed, and it brought forth fruition. But 75% of that did not. It fell over in the thorns. It fell over on the rocks. It went to the wayside. But 75% did not. Do you hear me? And all because when testing and trials come in life, it's going to see whether or not is your faith really pure? Is it really genuine? Do you have really a saving faith? Do you have a pure faith, a precious faith? Then he uses the illustration here. Peter does. He said it is like a goldsmith. He said, oh, your faith be tried in the fire. It's like a, a goldsmith. And he purifies that faith. And when he turns up the heat like Daniel chapter 3 with Nebuchadnezzar did with the three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace, and he casts them into it and turned up the heat seven times hotter. And the goldsmith takes the various metals and he puts it into the, <coughs> into the crucible and he turns up the heat up on it and up under that heat all the good stuff he puts a substance called dross 
and he puts it in there, and all the impure stuff comes to the top. And all the good stuff that goes down to the bottom, the pure, the gold, that's what God, he allows the heat of trials to come within our life to purify. Then he takes it and he skims off all the nickel. He skims off the impurities within that. And he wants the pure gold, something that's pure, something that's precious. The purer the gold, the softer it is. The more you're closer to the Lord Jesus Christ, the softer your heart is going to be. The softer, the blessed are the pure at heart, they shall see God. The more pure you are in your walk with the Lord, the more conscientious you're going to be. The more sensitive you're going to be to the Spirit. The purer the gold, the more it shines. It won't go green either. Okay, so you younger people haven't learned that yet. The purer the gold, the more it'll shine. And God, the purer your faith is, the more you're going to shine for Jesus. And you come through those trials of life, God is building you and you're stronger and you have a steadfast and it's unmovable faith. And there you are, it's more precious, it's more pure, it's more precious and more valuable than even, he said, the gold itself that perisheth. This is precious faith. That is exactly what you endured that. It's an enduring faith that you go through that trial and God's got something better on up ahead. And do you know, finally, he says, verse 8, whom not seeing you love and whom, though now you love in whom, uh, whom I see not, believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith. What is the end of your faith? Well, the finish line's heaven. Your prize is Jesus. Now, you not only have, you can have joy down here in the midst of trials. Now, many people still haven't learned, well, they say happiness, I, as long as something, they confuse joy with happiness. As long as something, happiness comes through circumstance. As long as you have the right circumstances, you're happy. As long as you're getting a payday Friday, you're happy. If it's work day on Monday and the blues come in. Yeah. If certain things are going right in your life, we are happy. But what about when certain things are going wrong? That's because circumstances dictate your happiness. That isn't. Happiness is different from joy. Joy comes from the fruit of the Holy Spirit and it's supernatural. It's not of the flesh. It's a work of the Spirit even in the midst of trouble. You say, how can you still keep an attitude? How can you be so positive? Look at all this around you. Well, you're saved. Guess what? You're a child of God. And the best is yet to come. And you know what? I can have joy unspeakable in my heart. This is the joy of the Lord. You can have joy within your soul. But not only here, but when this life is all over, it's going to be in the presence of the Lord. And he said, in his presence is fullness of joy. I believe in that presence is joy unspeakable and it is full of glory. The glory of God. So what if I got to go through some things down here? My future still is bright. I've got heaven in sight. Heaven's my home. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. These are things. You're going to be rewarded for your faith. Your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Your faithfulness in the Lord. Thank you, Christian. You're for serving the Lord. The Lord's not going to go, he said, let you go unnoticed. If you do it the right way, the right motive, and in the Spirit of God, he's going to bless you for your faithfulness. You're going to hear the word, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. Now enter into the joy of the Lord. When you take a job in a church, you know what? You're not taking it for me. You're taking it for Jesus. And what you do with that? If God called you to do that job, you're to do that job. You're to be faithful at it because you're not doing it for me. You're doing it for Jesus. When I took this church as pastor, bless your old heart, I love you dearly, but I didn't do it for you. I did it because Jesus called me to do it. And when the Lord, and when you're faithful, I accepted the call to ministry, not because of man, but because of Jesus, because he called me to do it. And you know what? I've been doing it several years, and I'm not going to quit. 
I'm in this too far. I done burn all my bridges behind me. And I wouldn't, and I know better than that, salvation's not in me, it's in the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know what? If I'd had to scratch and claw, I'm going to keep right on going. That's an enduring faith in spite of the obstacles or whatever the devil tries to throw at me. You know, I've got my mind made up, my foot's on the rock, and I want to see Jesus, and I want to see all those who've gone on before. So I don't know what you're going through today, but I can share you. You know what? If you just trust in the Lord, there's something better on up ahead. Every time, every time, if you have lived long enough in your life, whatever you're going through right now, there's something better. It's, it didn't come to stay. This too shall pass. You're just going through a trial. It doesn't, it doesn't stick around. Storms come, storms go. You know what? The night's going to slip away and then there's going to come the joy. Weeping endureth for a night and joy comes in the morning. There's going to be the breakthrough and there's going to be the blessing. God will reward you for your faithfulness. There's always something greater up ahead. There's always a promotion. There's always something better on up ahead. There's a healing. Whatever it may be, it looks like right now. Don't know how, but you just got to trust in the Lord. I'm on by faith. This is an enduring faith. Lord, I'm trusting in you. And you're going through that. And he's purifying your faith. And it's more precious. And the more pure it becomes, and the more brighter it becomes, the more shiny you are, all these things, the more light you put off to other people around you. Look at, look at her. You know, others see the difference in our life because when we go through trials, when we go through how we handle them, others see the greatest difference in mine and your life. You can be a witness if it was a doctor that doesn't know the Lord. You can be a witness to them, a nurse. So many other people you come in contact with each and every day and say, you know, I don't know why, how they could be so happy. I don't know how they could have joy like they do. And their face lights up. And they look like they're aglow. And still going through all that. That's because it's supernatural. It's not natural in the world. And the world sees something, they see something different in you. And you become that. That's an enduring faith. Let's stand, if you will. I've seen people come, you've seen them, I've seen them start, and they never finish. It is not how you start this race, it's how you finish. And you need to finish well. It isn't either, if you all know the little nursery, I believe it's a nursery rhyme, a tortoise and a hare. And though the rabbit, by nature, it's faster than a tortoise, the turtle. Who won the race? The turtle. Do you know why? Because of his consistency, his patience, and his enduring. That's the same way. I've seen a lot of people like the rabbit start out real quick. They get all emotional. They're all excited for Jesus. But then so all of a sudden, they've fallen by the wayside. They shipwrecked their faith, as the Bible says. They're no longer doing it anymore. People look over there and they're trying to give them all kinds of this and that assurance. My friend, there's, probably, there's something wrong. There's something over it. That's between them and God. They're going to have to, there's something wrong within their heart and their life. You cannot, I can't give you, I give you scriptures. I can't give you necessarily the assurance personally within your own heart. And right. You know whether you're right with God when you're not. You have to know that yourself. It's a, this is a relationship with the Lord. You have to know when you're right or wrong. Uh, you have to know if you're in God's will, if you're not. Now, everybody has them. Peter used the same word later on, manifold. Here he used manifold temptation. Later on, he used manifold grace. You know God, it's because he's got a variety of grace. Does God have living grace? Yes. Does God have dying grace? Yes. Paul said, he says his grace is sufficient. When he had a thorn and God wouldn't remove that thorn, he said his grace is sufficient.
Grace is the supernatural, supernatural power of God that sometimes you're being held up by the presence of the Lord and you couldn't, couldn't go forward in life. God is still carrying you and he is blessing you and it will show up right when you need it most. And that's because you're trusting simply in the Lord to take care of you. Hold on, hold on to the end. That's an enduring faith. It goes all the way in spite of whatever comes your way. You're going to go all the way with Jesus. Let's sing. If anyone has a need today, you come. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thy blood was Thank you.